Hello, everybody. Mm. <laughs> this is fun. I love this part. <laughs> you might look at everyone here on the other page from you. Hello. Mm, nice to see everybody. Very much so. So we're going to um, enter into today's practice with um, a little bit of karuna, compassion, just in case. <laughs> Anyone noticing any suffering inside or out? So often the process of finding, <clears throat> finding our heart can be helped a little by just placing our hand on our heart center and getting the sense of, if there's a, a sense of tenderness in your hand, a tenderness or care, that just touching the heart center, very simply receiving the touch there, a connection. And then if you can, receiving care, tenderness, kindness. And the receiving can feel like Receiving a breath or sound. And incline whatever way is happening. If it's more toward kindness, that's fine. Or a quiet tenderness. Our vulnerability. You don't have to keep your hand there, but you can if you want. And for today, Aruna is particularly for caring about any pain physically in our body or mind, heart. But sometimes it can just feel like a, the awareness opens up around our body, the space around our body. And there's a quiet connecting with our whole being, mind, body, heart, with care. Tenderness, kindness, and notice the movement of the breath coming and going within this container of care. And then letting the attention go 
to wherever it's drawn in our body. There may be places that need quenching. Or if not, just staying with our whole body. sometimes a phrase I care about myself or I care about pain can be helpful or not. Can you check to see, is this tender, caring awareness sinking in? Is there any place in our body receiving it? Sometimes it can feel like the awareness infuses. So when our attention opens up to being aware of hearing, there can be this tender, kind field of awareness. Just receiving the vibrations, textures of silence and sounds, just as they're happening. Noticing them disappear just as they are. care. We can care about impermanent. Noticing textures, vibrations of physical sensations in our hands, just like with the sound. That exquisite pause and tenderness of awareness. that cares. And a tune, it's like finding a radio station, attuning to just what is appearing.
directly, not through the thought process. And of course, with the movement of the breath, receiving the tenderness of the care within the movement, coming and going by itself, just as it is. this path into a wider and deeper field of awareness with compassion. It's just the simplicity of caring about thinking itself. not being under our control. Doesn't matter what the thoughts are, just infusing that area with care or tenderness our kindness. Whatever emotion may arise, especially any difficult one. They are a path into compassion. So very valuable. No matter how painful path into caring about them is deeply valuable. Whether it's sadness or despair, anger, fear, anxiety, Loneliness, happiness, joy, enthusiasm, mudita, kindness, care, peace. all impermanent. Valuing this unentangled care tenderness 
Aynen.
Mm. I just have one uh, announcement, which is for those of you who know that um, Steve is in Steve Smith is in Chiang Mai, and for those of you who know there have been catastrophic floods in Chiang Mai. It hasn't been getting big news, but um, it's been quite quite a f number of days, but he got evacuated um, and is in higher ground right now. Probably he will have to stay there for quite some time. The area he is in is in the area where the Ping River that flows through Chiang Mai uh, really, really overflowed. So it was up to here. <laughs> and, you know, they're not, there's a lot of problems with electric and flooding. So um, a lot of people are evacuated. And at this point, things are, are just a matter of hoping no more, no more rain for a while, which is a few places on this planet right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, we just, Jesse and I just wanted to let you know that, that he's okay. And may our planet <laughs> and all of us on it um, do the best we can to hold on to our goodness. Yeah, hold on to our goodness and help each other as best we can. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Michelle. Michelle herself has been very busy <laughs> helping uh, coordinate, you know, I mean, always uh, with Steve these days, but certainly, um, certainly the last few days. Um, yeah, it is, it's amazing. Um, you see there in North Carolina and like Michelle said, so many places, you know, the there are powerful um, sorry, Gloria, yeah, that's an error. Um, This fact that we are in such amazing times, you know, so fraught, you know, with all kinds of calamity and and also, of course, the ways that we see people showing up and helping and supporting one another. not just in calamity, but even in regular day, day lives, it's, um, it is important to not forget that, you know, not to get so overwhelmed just with the catastrophic realities, you know, and perspectives and stuff that are A little bit in the air we breathe these days. I always find it helpful when you know Michelle reads some of these ancient Chinese poets. You know, from or it depends what you consider ancient, but six hundred, eight hundred years ago, and um, and tells a little of their biographies of seeing how how much we are living in unique times, and there is something common you know to these cycles and rhythms and human history of of hardship and hope and the flourishing of arts and culture and war and despair um 
and how much of these beautiful poems that we have to inspire us to lean on, you know, just that one, looking at that one thing, you know, how much of that has come from people working through the hardship of their times, you know, of their, their eras, materially, socially, environmentally, politically, and then, of course, in, in the heart. And so I, I wanted to talk a little today just about <laughs> a little in some varied ways about this um, dilemma you know, we have uh, and the work we have and the tools we have and the um, possibilities we have in terms of learning how to manage and face and grow within such difficult circumstances. Um, and mostly today will be as um, in terms of as like individuals, you know. Of course, I know there are, you know, of many, many of us, many people who, you know, long to find collective responses and uh, understandings and solutions and ways of managing and figuring out these systems, you know, that we're a part of. How to heal, how to change, how to make more just and expansive. And so that's, of course, beautiful, valiant work, important work. Um, and I think the Buddha's teachings around that are interesting and and there's there's interesting conversation there and um and yet they're limited, you know, I think in terms of their design to attend to large scale system change, you know mm. There's more to say about that. I won't go into it a lot, but uh, you know, of course, he offered teachings about nonviolence and you know all these beautiful qualities of the heart that we can cultivate that are that have social value and you know implemented on a grand scale have the potential for a lot of impact. We also can see that the thrust of his direct teaching and preoccupation and um, method and really the effort of his life was in trying to create the context, the stable conditions for individuals to be able to manage the the suffering that we experience in life are as these sort of different layers of systems, you know, whether it is ecological and weather systems, you know, especially here with all the kind of agricultural metaphors from that era, you know, the uncertainty of that for farmers and um, people living in villages, right? We see that now, how the infrastructure can be so vulnerable. The social caste systems that were at play in his time, the and the systems of, of self and meanness and the structure of identity and the rafters, you know, of the construction of meanness and these systems that we are cultivating and um, subject to, you know, how do we liberate ourselves kind of on, on that level? I will say the... Um, there's a, for folks interested, there's a wonderful book um, by a professor, I think, I can't remember where in India, uh, Uma Chakavarti, The Social Dimensions of Early Buddhism. It's really a worthwhile read. Put that in the chat there. Um,
but I think this question of, you know, how do we manage the overwhelm? You know, the 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 levels of hardship that we experience as humans and all the sort of different degrees of systemic quality of that hardship. Uh, and that sense, of course, the Buddha described, you know, there's the suffering that comes from being um, brought together with unpleasant sensations in the heart, mind, body. There's the suffering that comes from being separated from the pleasant. And then there's this quality of suffering that just has to do with the, the relentlessness of experience, right? The, the constant flood of fabrications. You know, it's often talked about as this great flood, you know, that we are inundated by. And it's not even just their pleasant or unpleasant nature, but that the rush of it, the incessantness of it, and um, that longing to be free, you know, from that level of suffering. There's a book I'm reading now by Ingrid Contreras, the, uh, a man who could move clouds. And uh, part of the story has to do with um, an undercurrent, it has to do with a, a time where she had a, a bicycling accident and um, had amnesia for some period of time for just about eight weeks. Um, there's a sort of correlative thing with her mother's life where her mother fell as a child and had amnesia for a long period. And so this is just a little bit of a description of this. Of course, when it first happened, there was, you know, it was very traumatic. It was very disorienting. It was very uncomfortable, confusing. Um, and but that after some period of time, she realized that there was something, she didn't actually want her memories to come back. There was a, a relief in this spaciousness um, and that it was sort of slowly being impinged upon by her memories and, and reality, uh, her, her previous sort of structure of reality coming back. Amnesia was like living at the world's edge majestic and incredibly lonely. You can't cuddle up to the end of the earth. I tried for as long as possible to call up the unimaginable freedom I had felt in my body before knowing I was a body. For many weeks, if I closed my eyes, I could still taste what it was like, but slowly the feeling dulled. And now all I remember is a concept. The stupid things that people say are true. Ignorance is bliss. I had no power over my memory returning. Bit by bit, I fell asleep and awoke unwillingly with new memories. I remembered throwing my head back in laughter in a bar. I recalled how once when I was walking back to my apartment very late at night, my boots sank into the snow and the slush leaked into my shoe, deadening my toes. Wind whipped the hair on my face in a speedboat. I woke up one morning knowing the plot of Moby Dick, the five zones of the ocean. I could not remember emotion. I could not remember loving my mother or my boyfriend. Like a cracked up scientist, I wrote in a notepad, maybe emotion is what comes at the end after an accumulation of memory. One day I woke up with an image seared in my mind mommy pulling tarot cards. The cards were spread before me in a gentle arc and she was drumming her fingers in the air over them, looking for the ones she had to turn. I held my head before the flood of memory that came. Every muscle in my body seized. I was asphyxiating. I gasped for oxygen that never seemed to find my lungs. I tucked myself into a ball, renamed the event Growing Symphony of Terror. I entered a fugue state then gracefully, I took leave of my body. I watched myself from above, a human specimen suffering from an alien affliction. I stood in awe of the terrible. By the end of eight weeks, like this, torturously, torturously I remembered all.
and it's a you know a memoir autobiographical uh, I think this this sense that we can so often have of how terrible it would be to lose our memory you know to to not know who we are to to not have that how disorienting it would be of course you know the the experience of in dementia or alzheimer's is you know we we pathologize that experience as negative you know um and not to say that it isn't but this very powerful in my experience sort of reflection on this sense of relief that she felt of not knowing who she was and not even identifying with this body right the sense of freedom and of spaciousness and the terror actually and the agony of just the blocks starting to kind of come back right like you can see nothing nothing that would maybe come across as agonizing you know not just terrible memories or bad ideas it's just like the fact of this structure reforming itself and the the agony of that right the the pressure of that the the stress of that the dukkha of that right the responsibility the weight of that physically and emotionally of having to kind of be recomposed There's a, a powerful, um, oh, who wrote that? Um, oh, D.H. Lawrence about, um, the the story of um Jesus coming back to life in the in his tomb um uh, it's a short story uh but again it's like this thing of like this miracle that everyone focuses on as like this you know the amazing thing <laughs> that that after death Jesus came back to life but Lawrence describes it in this agonizing way of just like having to actually come back into incarnation into the body and how excruciating that must have been after the release of wherever he had been previously right um in death and non-existence and you know some other realm this way in which um we actually can just experience the six sense doors and our bodies and our, our, our stories and our future and our worries. And, you know, the ways, not just that the world out there actually is, but the, the construction of the world in our own hearts and minds, how hard that is and the suffering that causes from these structures, but also from resisting the process of restructuring. Right this important thing which I'll you know say more of later of like the buddha's teaching of you know the the this idea of the most profound equanimity only comes through and results in the no more desire for existence but no more desire for non-existence you know that that longing for for space and freedom from this oppression can have its important beautiful um, inspirations and motivations, but also it can have um, uh, a negative attachment as well. It's important to kind of recognize the the distinction between those. And this question of like, where do we develop kind of healthy, mechanisms of space and distance and um, to protect ourselves and where is it just not feasible you know where is it um, not realistic in our world and our lives I was talking to um, a friend the other day uh, and telling him about a, a time, uh, it was after the, 
that or the, the invasion, the U.S. invasion of um, uh, Afghanistan and then Iraq, that I um, I decided to stop paying my federal income taxes, and this I've written about this elsewhere. It's sort of a longer story of war tax resistors that I have been um, you know deeply influenced by in my in my life and um, and how. You know, there was a sort of like a 10 year period basically where I um, gave the money that I would have otherwise been putting, sending to the government, and a large part of that going to military spending would, you know, gave it to other causes and organizations and people who I thought were doing what I felt was ethical, you know, in the world. And, um, this way in which it created a, a sense of like moral purity and clarity, um, and righteousness that had its, you know, very positive, beautiful, important qualities that I think were, that was very meaningful to me, you know. Um, and at the same time, it created like a lot of instability in my life, <laughs> you know, uh, on kind of many different levels. Right. But there was just this, this point where it was like the, what it ended up having, it's like the taxes were getting paid anyhow. Uh, event ultimately the, I couldn't have a bank account. I didn't have, you know, there was a lot of like structural instability in my life. And so I realized I had to kind of reconcile with the IRS and, um, come back into a, a less pure, more um, negotiated relationship with the society that I live in and the government of that society. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that it was a humbling and, and an important experience for me on a bunch of levels or a number of experiences, but, but that quality of where do you feel like you need enough, so much distance to be free from certain entanglements? And yet, what is the cost of that distance? And is that actually creating something more sustainable and, and secure? Or does it actually undermine a certain security? And where is there a sense of... Um, I'll be careful about the like language, but something young in it, you know, uh, something not ma fully mature in terms of a relationship, you know, to the system. And so he said to me, oh, yeah, he's like, I did something similar. Uh, he said there, he was like, I just, I didn't, all I wanted to do was fish. I wanted to just go fishing. And I knew I still had to work. So I was okay, I was okay doing some work. I would work enough as I had to. But I just, like, like, I didn't want anything to do with the system and the world and all that. So I decided one day I was never going to use a pen again or a pencil. It was like, that was it. I wasn't going to have any, <laughs> I wasn't gonna have anything more to do with, like, the written word. And uh, I was like, wow, that that's like some other level of the, of the of the kind of movement that i sort of aligned with that i like i was like so beyond like what i had imagined i'm like well you weren't gonna and he's like and it lasted about four days you know until i had to go to the bank and like sign it <laughs> sign a check <laughs> oh, i got such a kick out of it it was so great because it was like um Yes, right. There is some like emotional level at which there was something very resonant with like what I had done. It might not have had like, you know, these like, uh, you know, other elements that might not have been there. Right. But this sense of like, I don't want anything to do with this. And it's all bad. It's all oppressive. It's all toxic. It's all just causing suffering. And I can be free outside of that. You know, if I stop writing or I stop doing whatever, you know. And, and then that sense of like, oh, well, what is the next layer? It'd be like, well, if I just, I just, I'm not going to think in words, you know, like, yes, you get that it's, this whole thing is like structured by words and vocabulary. And if you just refuse to use words or to speak or to think in words, you know, that, that the idea that that would somehow be the, your ticket to freedom, 
you know, um, and how like beautifully misguided that is, of course, right? Partly because it's impossible, um, but partly it's like that this thing that we have to learn as yogis is that that freedom doesn't come out of control. And that there is a way actually in what he was describing and then my kind of ongoingness is like, well, that is not totally dissimilar, right? To what we do when we're on intensive retreat. This commitment to silence, which includes not writing, not reading, uh, that we are in silence, you know? And, and fortunately, you know, we are not in a tradition that is trying to turn off the mind, right? It's not trying to turn off thinking or thought. It's trying to ultimately be able to observe it so that we can have a liberated experience with it, through it, rather than needing to get more and more distance from it in order to feel free. Which doesn't mean that there aren't conditions that help us get quiet, right? And help us, you know, move away from the world. And we do, we stop reading, we stop watching the news, we, you know, this idea of some degree of renunciation and protection is important in this move to be able to develop the capacity to actually go closer to things in order to get free, right? In order to develop a relationship with them of wisdom, of insight that doesn't need them to go away and isn't disturbed by when they arise, right? That deepest peace um, and how, or one of the deepest pieces, I'll say, of, you know, of equanimity, upeka. Um, and how how important it is and how important a distinction it is and how it can look similarly, right? This, of course, many people come to sit, meditate, this idea of like, I can't turn off my mind, I can't make the thought stop. And that's idea that that's somehow supposed to be what we're doing. Um, and how long it takes to kind of shift from that desire. I mean, of course, there's always times in our lives where we still wish it would just shut up in here, you know? So with that sense of believing that that's really the true freedom or the deepest freedom is something, yeah, that takes time to kind of undo and unlearn and really reorient towards what that freedom means, you know? I have like a mild interest in like certain sciences, mild in the sense that like I don't feel like I'm ever going to learn the the like mechan like the the language necessary to actually learn these things in depth. But but they're always interesting to me. And I, this thing with math, um, uh, like mathematics, and this question I can't remember where I was reading about it recently. But this question of like is mathematics are mathematics real? or are they just a human creation? And that even in the scientific world and in the mathematical world, apparently this is not a settled topic, right? Um, that it's unclear. It's like, is math, okay, first of all, apparently it's maths. It's, it has a plural, always. It's not math. So that in itself, I can't even wrap my head around that we call it maths. Uh, and what are, that mathematics is a plural word. I doesn't even I don't even know what that means. But this question of is it is it actually a fundamental truth of the universe, or is it something that humans through our own kind of you know cognitive we create certain axioms that can like support each other, and then you can start to build this structure of something that really seems to represent the world well and define it and predict certain things and functions in a, a an amazing way, you know. Um, but I think it is important to know, it's like, oh, why that sense of these, these structures that are necessary, that are valuable, but that are also oppressive, you know? I mean, I find it oppressive, right? They doing the books every month of like spreadsheets and the maths feel like they're going to conquer me, you know? But they do cool things with these maths like send out little satellites okay the voyager little space probes that they sent out 1977 they said that the like 
the mechanism that like opens your unlocks your car door is like more sophisticated than the computer that they have on these things you know um these they got two voyagers they sent out in 1977 to just try to check out the most outer realms beyond the solar system so you have in the sphere it's called the heliosphere that's the the realm in which the sun's magnetic fields plasma solar winds these currents that are just like emanating from the sun is this it's the field in which those are still dominant right they're still dominating the the at the the space you know within the solar system and they have like audio recordings of these you know the sort of static and sound of of what it's you know these these solar winds are moving at a million miles an hour out there and then finally the satellite gets to a place uh termination shock which is where the pressure of the outside system of the universe right the the more light the force of that is kind of pushing on the pressure between the rest of the universe and our little solar system is pushing back on that magnetic field and uh you go across the helio sheath to the helio pause right which is where there's like the solar winds die down to 250,000 miles per hour until finally and this apparently in 19 or in 2018 2012 and 2018 the two satellites cross into interstellar space which is about 119 astronomical units away one astronom astronomical unit is about 150 billion miles so 119 of those things. And you get out there and it's like, it's finally quiet. And you can, you can hear it, you know, you can hear it's like, and then it's like, and it's, it's not totally quiet. You're still getting all these solar winds from like the rest of the universe, but it's like very disparate, you know, and that's the farthest uh, you know human made object has ever gone and it's still able to send us a little bit of signals it seems like in the next couple of years they think it'll run out of juice or whatever but this amazing sense of just like how far sometimes we feel like we need to get to have it be a little quiet and that that's it's not just us, you know, it's not just our little lives. There's something, it's like the static, the static of the solar system, you know, is so intense and so voluminous, you know, these, it's like, you know, it seems like empty space to us, but it's filled with this, like, these currents that the sun is just like generating around and swirling around this heliosphere. How much energy, how much time, how much math it takes to like get out of that space and go beyond it, you know? Really, um, I don't know. So I, to me, something very powerful, something humbling and beautiful, and um, of course, intense. You know how far out there these things are. These are the ones that are carrying that gold disc. Right, the I don't know if like you know, people recorded saying hello in a million languages and things like that, you know, out into the universe.
there's a, another book I, I finished rereading recently, um, the Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. I don't know if any of folks know it's from like the early 70s. I read it when I was like 16 or something, and it just totally blew me away. And I, I happened to see it again at a bookstore recently. And I said, oh, I should reread that. And it's it's manageable because it's like little one or two page chapters, you know. There's something about, it is a, a fictitious conversation between Kubla Khan and Marco Polo. Um, and whether they're speaking or miming or imagining the conversation, which are all three seem are offered as possibilities. It's mostly a, a stories of Marco Polo's visits to different cities. And so this is like, a, I don't know how many different mythological sort of cities that are spoken of. And this this there are a lot of these places where it's like it gets at these these tensions between our sort of like our direct experience of ourselves and with each other and how they form our our cities our societies um i thought i'd share a few of these in chloe a great city the people who move through the streets are all strangers at each encounter they imagine a thousand things about one another Meetings which could take place between them, conversations, surprises, caresses, bites. But no one greets anyone. Eyes lock for a second, then dart away, seeking other eyes, never stopping. He goes to describe a bunch of things. And thus, when some people happen to find themselves together, taking shelter from the rain under an arcade or crowding beneath an awning of the bazaar or stopping to listen to the band in the square. Meetings, seductions, copulations, orgies are consummated among them without a word exchanged, without a finger touching anything, almost without an eye raised. A voluptuous vibration constantly stirs Chloe, the most chaste of cities. If men and women began to live their ephemeral dreams, every phantom would become a person with whom to begin a story of pursuits, pretenses, misunderstandings, clashes, oppressions, and the carousel of fantasies would stop. In the Ercilia, to establish the relationships that sustain the city's life, the inhabitants stretch strings from the corners of their houses, white or black or gray or black and white, according to whether they mark a relationship of blood, of trade, authority, or agency. When the strings become so numerous that you can no longer pass among them, the inhabitants take leave. The houses are dismantled. Only the strings and their supports remain. From a mountainside, camping with their household goods, Ercilia's refugees look at the labyrinth of taut strings and poles that rise in the plain. That is the city of Ercilia still, and they are nothing. They rebuild Ercilia elsewhere. They weave a similar pattern of strings, which they would like to be more complex and at the same time more regular than the other. Then they abandon it and take themselves and their houses still further away. Thus, when traveling in the territory of Ercilia, you come upon the ruins of the abandoned cities without the walls which do not last, without the bones of the dead which the wind rolls away, spiderwebs of intricate relationships seeking a form. I don't want to be last all. All this, these storytelling, so that Marco Polo could explain or imagine explaining or be imagined explaining or succeed finally in explaining to himself that what he sought was always something lying ahead. And even if it was a matter of the past, it was a past that changed gradually as he advanced on his journey. 
because the traveler's past changes according to the route he has followed, not the immediate past, that is, to which each day that goes by adds a day, but to the more remote past. Arriving at each new city, the traveler finds again a past of his that he did not know he had. A foreignness of what you no longer are or no longer possess lies in wait for you in foreign, unpossessed places. He enters a city, sees someone in a square living in a life for an instant that could be his, could be now, could now be in that man's place if he had stopped in time long ago, or if long ago at a crossroads, instead of taking one road, he had taken the opposite one. And after long wandering, he had come to be in the place of that man in that square. By now, from that real or hypothetical past of his, he is excluded. He cannot stop. He must go on to another city where another of his past awaits him, or something perhaps that has been a possible future of his and is now someone else's present. Futures not achieved are only branches of the past, dead branches. Journeys to relive your past was the Khan's question at this point, a question which could also have been formulated, journeys to recover your future. And Marco's answer was, Elsewhere is a negative mirror. The traveler recognizes the little that is his, discovering the much he has not had and will never have. I think there's just um, something very powerful and deep and fun in the kind of reimagining of how people might live together in these in cities right and how we might conceive of these social relationships that are uh, familiar and different right a lot of these cities it emphasizes sort of like one angle of like you know, yes, that we do fantasize about our relationships to other people. What if that was the entirety of uh, what a society looked like? We do have um, all of these invisible threads that connect us. What if they were made material? And that was the kind of the structure, the physical, visible structure of the world we lived in. Um, that sense of being able to at least imagine these things and reimagine these things can give us a sense of like the structures and the systems that we're in and how oppressive they are and why they feel so oppressive. And yes, sometimes like kind of like new ways of exploring them, understanding them, finding relationship within them. All right, the last not clearly Dhamma thing I'm going to mention. Has to do with a very, I like a sort of, a, so we're in this time where, as of course many folks know, you know, the, um, the realm of like psychedelic therapies are coming into kind of prominence. And there is this, kind of place of like is it is it being adopted into the mainstream you know the kind of therapeutic uh, uh kind of frameworks and systems is there a, a way for that to happen um you know what are the values the dangers the strengths uh and all of that of course uh and so it's one of these places and you see that with mindfulness too right where they're so you have the maths of maths and of the literature and um, this idea of the maths of like um, cognitive science, right? Uh, these other kinds of scientific things. And so there's like these lang the language, just the language that they use, right, is uh, unfamiliar. But there was an interesting thing I read in a um, in a kind of longer article that led me to a study about possibility of psychedelics leading to false beliefs. So the, the part of the value is seen as like 
the the opening the mind to getting out of kind of habitual beliefs and um, that what is so often described in terms of psychedelic experience are what they talk about as there's a bunch of words noetic consciousness right noetic quality insight moments eureka heuristics uh insight like the experience of feeling like you're having an insight into something um and a cool like some kind of interesting stuff about how so there's the value of that experience the ways in which there seems to be a lot of evidence to the positive possibilities of that but also this questioning around does just when we feel like we're having an insight the experience of feeling insight if does that actually mean you're having an insight <laughs> is like this sort of intro, they're trying to figure that out right in like all of these sort of philosophical but also like chemical and neurological ways you know so i'm just gonna use some of this language prediction error signals precision waiting interceptive reflection no, interoceptive reflection, which apparently is meditation. Attentional capture, dopaminergic insightfulness, referential processing, semantable memory, semantic priming, uh, fact-free learning, noetic consciousness, and noetic quality. And so this, you know... Um, this sense, though, that there is the potential for people to have insights that are not true. And I think I, I, it made me remember um, in many years ago when I had my own experiences with some psychedelics. I remember there's a very clear thing of like, I remember having an experience where I was like looking at my sneaker and and like, I just felt like I understood like there was the moon and there was my sneaker and like I understood like what they had to do with each other right like they it was just like it all made sense you know and I was it was so cool to read that thing in this article being like does that make any sense like is that is there actual insight in that or is it just that feeling that you have understood something profound you know I can't think of anything profound about that relationship in particular between sneakers and the moon. But I I don't dismiss the notion of that feeling, how what a good feeling that is, right? And how that there might be therapeutic value in that. And of course, there might be therapeutic value in actual insights that are meaningful about people's lives and their selves and stuff like that, that can come out of that. But it is an interesting concern, right? And and a very powerful one in terms of vipassana, where I feel like, you know, this is again the, the maths of cognitive neuroscience and stuff. Where I, you know, people I'm sure will explore this and are exploring it. But all of this question of where, when we, what is right, the experience of insight in terms of classical Vipassana insight. And where are the places where that it points to something real? Where could there be the places where it points to something not real? And what's, I've, I mean, of the many things that I trust so much about our tradition is that so much of this understanding is already cooked into it, you know, that there, there is a very clear understanding of what's called the corruptions of insight that people can have at different stages along the actual progress of insight. So that there, you know, we have a, a very clear, sometimes maybe too clear, but, but helpful structure um, around, and again, it's like a system, right? And you see the sort of strengths and shadow of that, but around like, what is, you know, when, when the, you know, mindfulness and concentration and the various components of, you know, engaged attention and the seven factors of awakening come together. What are the kind of the progressions of insights that 
people start to have as that uh, moves forward. And there is a kind of classical understanding of that, that within that, there is a classical understanding of the corruptions of insight, where any one of these places and um, these experiences can lead toward wrong view and false views um, and unhelpful ones. Um, you know, that has to do with like, sometimes they're, they're very, the subjective experience of like people seeing lights, you know, flashing lights or overwhelming light, or, um, you know, sometimes it has like more visionary qualities to them. Um, you know, that there is a way that people can sort of take it as more meaningful than it is in terms of the progression of insight. And that by thinking, oh, something really good is happening and something really exciting is happening, we veer off of the path, right? We stop noting, right? We stop, it's like, oh, noticing this, noticing, noting pleasure, noticing engrossment, noticing enchantment, notice, noting wanting, right? It's like, in, we stop noting and we start to feel a, a sort of development of a self-view. Oh, I'm getting in, awakened or I'm enlightened or whatever. And usually that's just part of, going through these corruptions of insight are is part of the path you you watch that happen you know uh then there's like a lot of stuff that just has to do part or can have to do just with concentration piti pasadi sukha you know the um rapture engrossment the kind of turbulence of mind body experience that can uh, be very different than our normal day-to-day -day experience of mind and body that how engrossing that can be and it can start to give us more inflated sense um the tranquility deep experiences of sukha of pleasure of bliss you know this sense of the tendency for the mind to build a structure around it and be this is home this system this is the structure of me you know um and how we're so primed for that type of experience you know um kind of false insights, sada, faith even, determination, um, you know, that that can get over the top. We can get, we can get over exuberant about our faith, uh, the strenuousness, exertion. Um, there's ways of, you know, we, when you observe the mind that it can start to be really sort of thinking more about the past and the, and the future, jnana itself, knowledge, right? The distinction between insight knowledge and thought produced knowledge, you know, uh, more reflective knowledge. It's a very hard discernment, you know, um, at times, upeka, equanimity, and then nikanti, gratification, satisfaction, this ways in which we can get very, you know, the satisfaction of finally getting something beautiful to happen in our practice. <laughs> you know, we, we suffer and we struggle so much in our, in our efforts that sometimes it's um it's like oh we finally have something that feels good and there's nothing wrong with that these are inevitable and yet we watch this way the the, the mind starts to kind of build a structure a system out of that and this sense that you know that this the freedom is not buying into that it's not getting rid of sukha or getting rid of pleasure or getting rid of lights or getting rid of anything but it's developing that wisdom to be able to distinguish, right? False insight from true insight. What is path, what is not path, you know, is how it's often described in the suttas. How beautiful that is and how important it is to have teacher, have community, you know, because it's very hard for us to see on our own how important that is. How hard it is to not develop views, you know, um, structure of beliefs around these experiences. Mm, how humbling. And, you know, it isn't to say, of course, we, it's like we still have to be careful and we're gentle. And it's so much of why I think how we have tried to teach in our approach to Vipassana is like, you know, the mind is delicate, it is sensitive, it's so robust, and yet it's also so delicate, right? And 
you know, there is this needed, like the charge forward and get closer and look more closely and observe more perfectly, you know, mindfulness and concentration and the precision and the caring and all of those things, but also this sense of why and we need to back away, when we need to relax, when we need to give ourselves space, let things come back to kind of quote unquote normal, you know, because we have to see that it's like, we're not just trying to get, we're not, it's like, we need some distance. Yes, there are some degrees of protection in terms of renunciation. When we meditate in this tradition, we close our eyes. You know, it's not to say you can't meditate with your eyes open. Of course, there are, right? There are Zen traditions where that is the encouragement. And yes, it's just seeing. You have, it's just seeing. You can include that in your mindfulness. But we understand that we're so primed to create structure, to create system, to create the meanness and to, to, to consolidate the oppressiveness of this thing through visual you know we're so sensitive to the visual what is it like let's just close our eyes right we know it's there there's color there's shape there's form there's light these things are still happening but it's less distinct yes maybe we do put down the pen paper for a while and we withdraw from you know certain engagements and entanglements with the world for some period of time but we know that the freedom isn't just that, right? The freedom isn't just cutting off and not coming back, right? That it's actually through this relationship, right? The engagement of the mind and body, as oppressive as we can sometimes experience it. And yes, with the world, right? And, you know, this, this, these negotiations that we have of where do we protect ourselves? Where do we not overtax our overwhelm and, you know, overinduce overwhelm our hearts, minds, you know, that we can, what, what is the amount that we can actually manage and process and attend to of grief, of excitement, of whatever it might be. But that we, you know, yes, there is a management process in that for the sake of purifying the mind and strengthening the mind to be able to deal with the arising and passing of phenomena, to be able to deal with the truth of this kind of particular framework, you know, of reality. And it also has its maths, you know. I mean, the Buddha, you can just see, it's like he got enlightened and his little close group got enlightened. And then it's like, oh, well, you can come too and you can come too. And suddenly it's like, you know, what What might have felt like just this sort of intuitive way of being a renunciate started to get more complicated the more people there were, you know, more rules. And that was the answer. That's like, you know, talk, the, the, the ways in which the Buddha's like method might not feel like sufficient for our goals in terms of the society we want to create. You know, it was a totally undemocratic kind of patriarchal, uh, paternalistic um, system, you know, that he created that was not in, that was, you know, protected from society, but not trying to have an impact around in the society around him. And it was like lots and lots and lots of rules, really, is kind of like what he ended up just being able, creating, you know. And then when he passed away, the sense of, you know, the, the Sangha needing to develop feeling like they needed to develop more of the mechanics. Well, what's really going on here with, you know, cognition and all of the mechanics of it and all of the, you know, incredible commentarial tradition. Like, oh, another system, you know, another sense of that. And it's beautiful and there's so much value in it. And yet there is a rigidity to a system like any human created system or the solar system <laughs> or whatever, you know, this sense of like, there is an oppressiveness to every system, however orthodox or however unorthodox, you know, Aiken Roshi over in, uh, who was it? The Palolo Zendo, you know, uh, the great teacher there for so many years, he would go to his protests. And I think it sounds like he would always carry the same sign and just said, the system stinks. So it was like very versatile. You could bring that song to any protest, you know? And so there is this question of like, okay, given this the system of our tradition, you know, and the beauty of it, and of course the places where it's oppressive, the system of ourselves, of our minds, our bodies, and our worlds, it's like, 
where are we engaged in it in a way that is leading to liberation, to an ability to be with each moment of it without rejecting, without contracting, without clinging, that recognizes the the beauty and fallibility of all formations, you know, and the 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 hardship of what it is to be able to to be inundated by these things. And that the answer is yes, getting space enough to be able to observe things, you know, quietly, more precisely, you know, in a smaller container. Um, but that ultimately it is about learning to translate what we, those insights, right, that we have in, in those places and the way that they naturally and then with intention, you know, flow into our lives and our relationships and the world around us. Mm. So thank you all for your uh, attention today. You know, it was a, a longer talk, but we've been doing these sort of like talks and then just Q and A's for a while. So it seemed like it was good to do a, a more fuller one. Mm. So take care of yourselves wherever you are, each other, communities. Mm. And um, yeah, we look forward to hopefully seeing you next next Sunday. Oh, oh, wait. You don't have to wait, but if you wanted to wait, I I um I'm I made a bunch more of these pins. I was gonna even talk about this in relation to what I was saying. Anyone who wants one, you can just send an email to the Post in Hawaii and I'll send you one. Um this is just it's part of like how do we stay sane in the systems that we're in and however we choose to engage them and be involved that sense of not forgetting it's like noting noting the sense of being responsible for our own hearts minds and bodies um happy to send a button to anyone so uh yeah she can shoot an email to the pasta in hawaii and send you one mm. And tell me which color you want. All right. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Aloha. Even.